Welcome back to this series of tutorials by FlingOS. In this tutorial, we will be looking at the processor initialization and will extend our operating system so that it is ready to jump from assembly to C or C sharp code, of which both will be demonstrated in the following tutorials. In the previous tutorial, we compiled and ran our operating system for the first time, and then we looked at many of the registers and features that x86 offers us. We will be using that knowledge in this tutorial to initialize the processor properly. First, we must start with a bit of history. x86 has two modes called protected and real mode. To understand why they exist, we must look at how the architecture developed over time. Prior to the 80286 processor, the x86 architecture had just one mode. This mode was later to be dubbed real mode. When executing in real mode, the operating system could create multiple processes and have them execute from memory. However, there was no way to prevent one program overwriting the memory of another program. This meant that any malicious program could read or overwrite the memory of another program, and thus cause serious problems for both stability and security. In this sense, there was no protection of one process from another. The 80286 introduced protected mode. Protected mode allows the operating system to specify address spaces for processes so they cannot read or overwrite another processor's memory. When the processor first powers on, it is in real mode for backwards compatibility. The BIOS and bootloaders do not change this. This means we have to program our operating system to change it. Further to this, it is important to switch to protected mode as early as possible since internally the processor has to do configuration steps which may destroy any existing setup, or cannot be done once the processor reaches a later stage of initialization. So how do we switch to protected mode? Well, we recall from the last tutorial that the processor has a number of control registers, which allow us to turn processor features on or off. This is a good place to start looking. If we look at control register 0, known as CR0, we can see that bit 0 is labelled protected mode enabled. So all we need to do is set bit 0 of CR0 to 1 to enable protected mode. This should be one of the first things our operating system does. Recall that you cannot directly modify the CR0 register except by using the move operation. Also, we do not want to destroy any other existing values in CR0. So we must copy CR0 to a general purpose register, set bit 0, then copy the value back again. Go ahead and try writing the code. Resume this video when you're ready, and compare your code to the following sample. The code required is mov eax, CR0 to get the existing value of CR0, or eax, 1 to set the protected mode bit, mov CR0, eax to move the new value for CR0 into the CR0 register. Let's go ahead and compile that to test it. Since we will be compiling and testing fairly often from this point forwards, we will create a short batch script to run the commands for us. Open the folder where your files are located and create a file called build.txt. Edit this with notepad so it looks like the following. Now save the text file and rename it to build.bat. Now you can just double click the batch script to build your operating system.
Note that on Windows 7 and earlier versions of Windows, if you were to call the file build.bat initially when you create it, you would not be able to edit the contents. This is a weird and unexplained bug in Windows. Go ahead and test your OS now to check if it still works. Moving forward, we will now look at processor initialization, which will begin to draw together our knowledge of the x86 architecture, assembly language, and programs. There are key points of initialization we need to cover. These are the multi boot signature, disabling interrupts, checking multi boot startup and handling no multi boot, getting memory information, enabling protected mode, setting up a stack, initializing the GDT, and finally, our main entry point. In a previous video, I provided stub assembly code for setting up a basic operating system, but without explaining it. I will now endeavor to explain that code. The code I provided covers the multi-boot signature. As I explained in the booting tutorial, disks and files have to be formatted in particular ways so that the BIOS and bootloader can find them. Multiboot is a particular standard for transferring data between the bootloader and the operating system. However, it also provides a mechanism for the bootloader to detect what is a valid operating system and what is just other files. This mechanism is a signature that exists at the start of the OS data and identifies the OS as being multiboot compatible. The signature also provides limited validation that the file isn't corrupted and allows the operating system to request certain hardware configuration prior to being started. This configuration includes things like setting the current graphics mode. The stub code provided is sufficient for Sysinix to identify the operating system by the signature, and the configuration sets the display to 80 by 25 VGA text mode. When the operating system starts though, it is possible that a bootloader that is incompatible with multiboot has started the operating system. This would mean our OS is now running in an unknown, potentially unstable state. So the first thing our OS has to do is check that a multiboot based bootloader started the operating system. We also want to store useful information such as the size of available RAM. This information is given to us by multiboot. So how does multiboot pass information? It uses the general purpose registers. It sets EAX to be a special signature to identify that multiboot started the OS. It also sets EBX to point to a structure in memory that contains useful information, primarily for us, the size of memory. Thus, when our OS starts, we check EAX to see if it is set to 0x 2BADB002, or too bad to boot, which is the signature value for multiboot. Then we store the pointer to the multiboot infrastructure. Finally, we load and store the memory information by accessing the multiboot infrastructure. Notice also that following this block of code, I've included the code for enabling protected mode. Now that we know our OS is running in a stable environment, we need to set up a stack. This is fairly simple. To make sure our stack doesn't conflict with anything else in memory, we're going to allocate space for it. To do this is a short bit of assembly code, shown here. Finally, we copy the address of the top of the stack memory into the stack pointer register, ESP, remembering that the top of the stack is the highest memory address. The last piece of initialization we are going to do before moving on is to initialize the GDT, which stands for Global Descriptor Table. The Global Descriptor Table holds descriptors which dictate which areas of memory the processor allows to be executed and which it allows to be written to. These areas are known as code segments and data segments. These segments, aka areas, can overlap. The GDT also has to contain a null segment record as the first entry. If you haven't come across segments before, don't worry, we'll be discussing them in more detail later in the series when we cover virtual memory in detail. For now, just think of them as specifying areas of memory which are code or data, or both. The GDT is initialized in a special way. The GDT itself is a table, which resides any way you like in memory. Just like when we wanted space for the stack, we will be allocating space for the GDT inside our assembly code. 
However, we will also be initialising that memory to values in the format we want for the GDT. This will save us having to write code to fill in the values at runtime. To tell the processor where the GDT is in memory, we load one of the processor's operational registers with the address of the GDT. However, it's not quite that simple. The processor also needs to know the size of the table, along with the address, so what we actually need to do is allocate 6 bytes of memory. The first two bytes contain the size of the table, and the last four contain the address of the table. We then give the processor the address of the start of the 6 bytes we allocated. You can think of this almost like a pointer to a pointer in C. Here's the code for allocating the GDT table and GDT pointer. This should go at the start of RRS code, but after the multi-boot signature. And here's the code for telling the processor where our GDT is. So our complete main.asm file thus far should look like the following. Go ahead and compile the operating system using the batch script, and then test it in the virtual machine. You should see the colour outputted. Next time, we will be looking at how we can program our operating system in C, and link together our assembly code and the C code we're going to create.